Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show about the way tech and innovations are making us all better off. I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and we're talking talking today with Rosalind Layton about new 5G cellular technology and how it might change our lives over the next couple of years. Now, Rosalind's a visiting scholar with the American Enterprise Institute, a visiting researcher at Alberg University, and a vice president with Strand Consult in Denmark. It's quite a list. Thanks for coming on today, Rosalind. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You know, I just want to say I love the work you do at Cato. And, you know, I appreciate uh, all your listeners. I'm a techno optimist and I see, you know, our media gives us so much negative discussion about technology and I see all the benefits. So I look forward to our conversation today. It's true. We're kind of the uh, inverse of Black Mirror, right? Rather than the worst case scenario, uh, we try to imagine the uh, optimistic use cases for this new technology here on Building Tomorrow. Um, Why don't we start with the basics, Rosalind? Now, I know my phone company keeps bragging about, you know, how their 4G service is better than the other guy's 3G service. And I, I get that larger numbers are bigger and better than smaller numbers. So five is bigger than four. So 5G must be better than 4G. What is 5G? How does it work? And how is it better than what we currently have on our cell phones? Uh, 5G is the next um, iteration of the mobile uh, standards. Uh, it, it It talks a lot about speed. So, you know, between 10 to 100 times the speed of 4G today. Mm. So, uh, you know, that's a lot about capacity. The other important thing is about the lack of latency. So, you know, even though you probably enjoy 4G, there's a lot of some things maybe, you know, uh, necessarily streaming a movie, you know, you would, you, you don't even, you will get seamless capability. When you look at 5G, you have the ability to do remote surgery. So the quality, the speed, the lack of of latency in the data coming through, that's really what 5G is about. And it's also about uh, the use cases. I mean, we think a lot about our mobile phones and using the Internet. 5G is really about the Internet of Things. It's about machines using the Internet. It's about industrial applications, uh, railways and, and coal mines and oil fields and every kind of, you know, the electric grid smart cities, all of these uh, smart homes and so on, smart cars. So different sort of, it's not just about individual users. It's about connecting machines. It's about bringing intelligence to um, uh, the different activities that we do. And and so that's, you know, that's why it's uh, maybe for some of us might be hard to understand. We haven't experienced those things. Is It's not just about having a smartphone anymore. Yeah, it's more than just, okay, we're going to get incremental speed improvements to our cell phones. I mean, that's true. But um, I, it, in the way I've, I put it mentally with that combination of low latency and high bandwidth is to think of um, is to think of how like the stream of information being both something that flows faster and the channel is deeper, right? Like latency and bandwidth – both of which improve the kind of information data sharing uh, a flow between servers and your phones or other connected devices, um, which is, you know, leads to, does lead to faster cell phone use. But I do like how you mentioned it's about more than that, right? It's not right. just upgrading from the, you know, oh, my my Apple 7 is a little bit faster, my Apple 6, right. my iPhone 6, and, and, and so on. Um so- Can I say one other thing, too? Mm -hmm. It's also about more efficiency with the power consumption as well as the spectrum. Mm. One of the wonderful things that we have found with 5G was we've been able to recover parts of the radio spectrum we never thought that could be used for mobile service. So, for example, your listeners might have heard of the incentive auction. We took this low band spectrum that was used for television um, and recovered that. Uh, high and and using previously parts of the radio spectrum nobody thought could be useful for these things and 5g is intelligent so it can switch its capabilities depending upon the spectrum it's using the service that's at hand cool uh, it, it's flexible and uh, adjustable and smart so um, if you have an application that can be done on a um, uh, it, it will adjust to to be more efficient given the task at hand. Well, that that that, that kind of flexibility uh, seems very valuable, w- especially with um, 
Uh, I think some of the use cases you already teased in in your response uh, with like the Internet of Things or with uh, driverless vehicles where you have the potential for you know, you're, you're, let's say you're on the highway and you're driving your smart car It's and you want it to communicate with every single car it passes. They're sharing data seamlessly in real time and they're uploading data to servers um, you know, back at, at, at corporate headquarters for whoever the manufacturers are. You, you need that kind of flexibility because any gap in coverage has implications for how this technology functions uh, for the reliability of it and, and et cetera. So uh, I think that flexibility is quite fascinating, uh, especially given that it was – this is spectrum that if you'd had an auction for it years ago – would have been relatively valueless, right? Like we're only now seeing the, the potential value in what was considered kind of junk spectrum, which is fascinating right. as well. We're, that, that's actually quite interesting too. Um, maybe I should give our listeners a, a grounded example uh, when we talk about speed gains. So again, this isn't just about speed and we'll talk about some more applications here. But as I was trying to think of an, an illustration, we're talking about exponential gains in, in, in capacity and bandwidth. So uh, one illustration was uh, a thousand time, potentially a thousand time faster download speed. So an entire 4K high def film you could download on your phone in 10 seconds or the entire Transformers franchise in, in under a minute, though why you'd voluntarily subject yourself to cinematic torture, I don't know. But we're, we're talking about not, again, not just incremental increases, but exponential increases in the kind of capacity of, of 5G wireless. Uh, Rosalind, could you walk us through? So you mentioned a bunch of examples of where, wire, uh, where 5G, uh, what, what kind of technologies 5G could make plausible or kind of uh, uh, useful for mass adoption. Could you maybe explore some of those a little more for our listeners? Sure. So one of the things uh, I think we talked about was, well, what would retail be like? Let's say, you know, okay, a consumer application, you want to shop online. And so let's say we want, want to buy luxury goods, you know, cars or art, so on. Frequently, we want to feel the product in real life or, or test drive it or so on. You know, 5G would allow you to have kind of um, virtual reality, augmented reality, which are things where you'd have a kind of a what would look like a hologram of a person, a real person inside of a screen. Um, you would you could hold up your device or your tablet or your smartphone to your living room, which would be automatically repainted or reshuffled with the let's say the the kind of um, uh, art you wanted to buy or furniture that you'd want to buy. The ability of uh, of having that augmented with a with a with an avatar walking you through, so that you know you need to have a lot of throughput and data to have to have that work, and it needs to be seamless. You know, if there were so many gaps in the conversation, it wouldn't work. Mm. So, so that's one thing. I, I like the example of the autonomous vehicles. And by the way, you don't need to drive. I mean, our leading cause of death in the U.S. is drunk driving or car accidents. It's it's terrible. Um, you know, I mean, people do like to drive, but it's quite a dangerous <laughs> endeavor, all things, you know, if you look at, at the numbers. But there's so many, uh, there's so much information around and being able to harness it, put it together, and also fuel efficiency, um, other things that if you can imagine entire driving experience so that as, as uh, let's say the street lights, you know, that they automatically turn, they turn off and on if the, you know, if, if something is there, you know, conserving energy. Um, you have uh, the energy embedded within, uh, you know, using the different kinds of sensors within all sorts of surfaces. Um, the, uh, you know, the ability for the, um, you know, the car to take into account the weather conditions, or the safety conditions or the, um, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the traffic conditions and so on. All of those things that, you know, when we, of course, our human brains are very smart, but we can't. You know what? What you can't see that's around the corner that could be able to be incorporated into the, you know, in, into the experience to have a safer experience, more efficient, more speedy. Um, you know, so the other thing to say is, it's five G won't be a, a sort of a push button switch. We're going to evolve. A lot of the five G things will be start to be realized on four G. So a lot of these things we're starting to see parts of today. We're enjoying. Especially in healthcare, um, we're having a, a number of um, innovations there. 
some of these, some, uh, but where we'll see these shifts will be on the industrial scale. So for example, smart signaling for trains, um, you know, the ability to be able to, um, uh, you know, over agriculture, right? You want to, you want to be able to look if, if you had to survey, you wanted to plant a field, right? And if you take a microscope on the soil, there's all these nooks and crannies inside the soil. And then immediately you could have precision agriculture, which um, will adjust the planting or the uh, irrigation or the fertilizing or everything to the sort of micro level down to the centimeter of what the conditions are at that particular place. So that sort of ability to incorporate the information and deliver a service for what's exactly needed across huge miles and acres, right? That's the kind of thing you have to have a wireless network for that has um, long capability. You have to have the spectrum, the intelligence, the ability to process all of that in real time, automatically connected with devices. So that's a sort of higher order kind of processing that is just not about our telephone and our home computer. I mean, so we're really talking about the ability for industry to operate at a totally new level. And that's a that's where it's not just about us and what we can do every day. It's making our all of our interest industries more intelligent, more efficient. And that is important when we talk about how what can be the jobs of the future, because there will be all these um, if marginal efficiencies we will squeeze out where today that you know just the same way microtransactions and the long tail and how we've been able to how all of our systems have been able to find new sources of revenue or value because we now have the ability to measure at small places or in small increments, microfinance, that kind of thing. Think about 5G doing that in our industry. You know, we can all always think about how do we improve American industry, right? That, um, you know, oh, we say we ran out of oil. Well, we found new ways to find oil. I mean, keeping going all the time, always finding more efficiency. And so the spectrum example is great because we thought that the low band spectrum, that was junk and nobody could use it. Well, it turns out over long distances, that's super because you have a, a agricultural area or farm or what have oil field uh, or what whatnot, that, that you can actually turn that into something valuable. I am struck by a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, you, a lot of some of the use cases that that, um, that I proposed, like the uh, you know autonomous vehicles and the like, they are within our imagination. It's technology that is being developed on a relatively small scale, but that for mass adoption will require you know truly more capacity than we currently have. But again, it's within our imagination. It's something that we can currently see prototypes of. We can currently see you, know, you can drive your your Tesla on driver assist even right now. Um, but I, I like your industrial examples. I was actually reminded um, – I was at TechCrunch Disrupt out in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago and they had a startup on on the ex Exhibition Alley uh, for livestock, livestock tracking. So every individual animal would be tracked uh, and you could basically do fascinating things with herd management. You can tell which areas of the paddock they're – specifically in down to the inch so that you can maximize, you can prevent overgrazing more effectively. You can uh, do a better job of, of exercising them or not exercising them or where you put the feed to feed the whole herd, all kinds of cool stuff that's capable. But again, that requires for large scale adoption, it re just requires more bandwidth than we currently have. Uh, another example that came to mind uh, was uh, I saw a patent filing by Walmart to create um, little fleets of thousands of robotic bees that would do micro-targeted pollination. Uh, you know, we, we're having a crisis with, with bee die-off, which leads to problems with pollinating crops. And rather than just spraying fields, which is kind of the default right now and hoping some of that pollen drifts to where it needs to go, uh, you can be a lot more efficient and more cost-effective uh, increase, you know, uh, production per acre by, in theory, sending these fleets of bees. But again, that requires the kind of bandwidth that comes with 5G. And that's not something that's currently currently possible well, with 4G technology. Well, but let me say, right. And But what's so exciting about that is that our major, let's say that there will be like step function and improvements. It could happen in a rural area. So it's not like, oh, in Silicon Valley, we'll see this 
grade mm-hmm. five to mm-hmm. adoption. In fact, that may be the last place because, in fact, cities are some of the most difficult places to get this deployed. You know, you can go to a rural area where the, uh, you know, the particular residents or that municipality says, hey, bring it on. We want to, you know, but you could find in, across one railroad or one oil field or one farm, they will quickly make an application and have a proof point. Mm-hmm. So we could find, you know, Mississippi will be the leader or Indiana, Indiana or whatever. And so that's exciting democratization there that is that could I believe could bring some equalization between rural and urban areas, at least in terms of um, new economic development. So, so that's what's also exciting. We don't know exactly today, you know, where all the business models will be, you know, which industries will be first. I mean, we can talk about this uh, industrial internet of things and see that the, the efficiencies are there. Uh, definitely there are industries who want to get this deployed. You know, they're working with policymakers. They're, they're you know, trying to, to do, you know, drones and so on, administration trying to work with them. Um, but what's also exciting is that the established players we know today may not be the winners of the future. I mean, in fact, you will have a kind of a, a shakeup and what may emerge are companies we haven't heard of because doing, it's not clear exactly who will, build the better better mousetrap at, at, at today so but, it, but we're all watching these things as you talk about the livestock example or you know what we can see when you go to disrupt and these other conferences yeah so little by little it's happening and it's incremental it's not as i said it's not a push button and overnight everything will be the world of 5g it will evolve it'll be like a flywheel right little but you'll be a snowball effect little by little we are doing pre-5g at least 25% of Americans have some kind of Alexa or Google Home device that they use. So that so already um, Americans have ex- adopted extremely fast. I mean, even faster than they were adopting smartphones. So people have really quickly integrated these. They're experimenting and working with these things already. Uh, Verizon actually sponsored a panel at TechCrunch, uh, try, basically promoting what they're were, were trying to do with 5G uh, in contrast to AT&T. And um, they made a quite a large claim, and I'm actually a historian by training, and so it was a historical claim, and so I was intrigued by it. But they said they think of 5G as the, I think it was the fourth industrial revolution, which seemed a bit grandiose to me. But at the same time, there is there are some interesting corollaries, right, where uh, it, it like if you think of the combustion engine, well, when it's first developed, there's not a lot of immediate use cases. You know, its first application is industrial applications, uh, doing stuff that formerly required water power. Um, uh, but eventually, it transformed. It worked its way down to yeah, okay, we get the combustion engine as a driver of industrialization. Uh, so I, I thought that was a it was an interesting claim. I'm still somewhat skeptical. But what do you think, right. Rosalind? Do you well, see five so, G as having that kind of possibility? Yeah. Well, what I like, I really like that those two companies have a good rivalry because they're such a in the world of the tech, telecom and tech policy. People want to paint them out as a duopoly, and they're actually extremely different companies. They are as different as night, as night and day, and they're pursuing very different strategies. And I think for consumers and competition, that's fantastic. Um, it, it's a great thing. Uh, they have, well, now, of course, both of them have 5G strategies, but they're they are playing in very different parts of the ecosystem. They're placing <clears throat> bets in different ways. So, for example, um, you know, Verizon, it really wants to be first in the home broadband market. You know, they are, they want to displace cable. They want you to stop. They want you to give up your cable company instead buy the 5G home broadband product so that you'll get all your movies and broadband and everything through the air. And they're using a particular set of spectrum to do that. Uh, AT&T has a different strategy, you know, where they're working with, um, in many respects, becoming a content media company. You know that uh, they have purchased a number of well-known brands to deliver content, so they are they're they're in a they have a, a different view that way. They also have a, the biggest public safety network, so they're looking at this industrial application around public safety. That's extremely interesting because if you think about the way that we fight fires today or the way that we address disasters. We're so much more efficient today than we were five or 10 years ago. Uh, the ability. So, for example, when I was in we had a hurricane in Florida where my family lives uh, and I was in Denmark last year through the entire hurricane. I kept in touch with my family 
through a, through the internet. And we had we were in touch on you know SMS and Facebook and phone and so on. So that that the ability now that we can when we have disasters that we can locate people, we can rescue them. The way that first responders can coordinate to address um, when uh, when there's a, a there's an emergency, we have just overnight have improved that, and it's it's getting better all the time. So there's a lot of enterprise uses that you might not really hear about every day in the press, um, but they're going on. And those a, both AT and T and Verizon they are working in different ways. It's very exciting to see, and that's great because it's competition. They are um, they're also you know, have a lot of intellectual property. They're supporting different kinds of patents, different kinds of activities. So, um, you know, they are a real driver in our economy, just given the level that they invest. And and then, of course, Sprint and T-Mobile as well, as well as Comcast. I mean, just for your listeners to understand, one quarter of all the world's investment in broadband networks is going on in the United States today. I mean, we're just 4% of the world's population, and all of this money pours into our economy by private companies trying to figure out, you know, how do we, you know, how do we deliver the internet to people? What do we do? What are the services? So that is an important fertilizer for all the devices and services and applications and all that other stuff that goes on, because fundamentally we have companies who are willing to make an investment in networks. So 5G, we're looking at $275 billion over the next four to five years. Um, That's a staggering amount of money. It's more than, any other industries putting into the American economy. And, and so, and in many cases, it's not even clear whether, you know, how quickly, whether they will recoup all of that, because as I said, that money will, that investment may turn into ways of revenue for other parties, you know, all Mm -hmm. the other. So for example, the Googles and Facebooks of the world or the device makers or the other services and yet companies we've never heard of today. So that's an important part of the dynamism um, that, that we that 5G will create. We, and that story is being written right now. This actually, I think, leads us to something I was interested in asking you about, which was, so you have the, the two big dogs in rolling out 5G tech are AT&T and Verizon. Uh, the third and fourth largest uh, basically phone carriers right now are Sprint and T-Mobile. But my understanding is they're relatively distant third and fourth. Um there has been some brouhaha over a proposed merger between Sprint and T-Mobile, an attempt to kind of catch up with AT&T and Verizon. How does that play into this 5G story? Right. So, and by the way, you know, there's also cable companies, you know, so Comcast, <clears throat> Charter, these companies have very large footprints across the United States. They've already have wires in the ground and Wi-Fi networks. So <clears throat> they're interested to play in this place too. So it's it's not exactly correct to talk about the traditional mobile wireless carriers. Mm -hmm. You have also fixed wireless solutions that are, you know, companies that are not household names. They want to play in there. So we actually have a couple of dozen of competitors, in fact. But the instance for Sprint and T-Mobile, this is really a question of synergies and a level of investment. So, you know, Sprint and Sprint has a lot of spectrum. Uh, T-Mobile has a lot of customers. They have a prowess in marketing. You know, they're really good at uh, in marketing and winning mm-hmm. customers. And um, uh, they want to be able to um, combine their assets together and, you know, basically win market share, take away market share from AT&T and T-Mobile, Comcast. They want to play in the home broadband market as well. They've been very successful to do that, um, T-Mobile at least. So the process of consolidation is a is a natural process. It's it's always going, has been going on, and will continue. You know that the AT and T today is is not the, or the Verizon of today is not the companies that they were ten years ago. They all formed out of the breakup of AT and T, and all these sort of like new companies spawned out of it. The baby and, bells, yeah. The, so the baby bells broken up and reformed in new ways, and so on, grow in different things, different. You know, so it's a constantly evolving and changing. But in the case of the Sprint and T Mobile, this is a if you just look at the mobile wireless market, um, is that the, you know, the capability we have with just consumer mobile service, you know, we have increased by, I don't know, thousands of percents of um, improvement in the quality of mobile phones. And we brought down the price like 99%. So there's been tremendous efficiency 
in getting more capacity and low and you know meanwhile all the time that we're increasing the capacity on the mobile phone the price has fallen so all of these companies have in fact declining arpu which is avenue average revenue per user um so you get you get all over time increasing value um at a at a, a lower unit cost and uh you know so now the the opportunity is what's the next stepwise mm. function can i get more ever more data into my package can i do ever more things so <laughs> You know the other so Sprint and T-Mobile just want to you know go up the value chain if you will they want to be able to um, you know uh, take market share away from other players I mean that's a you know that's something that we should encourage um, so I, so that's what's going on I do get the impression <laughs> that in a sense what's happening is that the provision of raw internet of you know access to the internet is being commoditized and so the margins you know margins on commodities are much tighter than margins on you know other kinds of consumer services and goods. So as you right. say when you're trying to go up the value chain it's well you can get a healthier margin when you're selling you know streaming services like Netflix or you know some other kind of company but in a sense in the 5G world in the competitive 5G world uh, there's not nearly as much relative value in providing that service. I'm sure there will be for the the first yeah, one to get there. Yes, absolutely. So the value of your consumer broadband, if you're any one of those companies, will be, be maybe become smaller. So you really want to figure out what kind of enterprise or industrial use can I do? And that's why all these companies are making different bets in different enterprise sectors. So and they're buying content mm, because mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't want to be in the world of, you know, commodity give me a dumb pipe. I mean that's you know, our, for a long time, our regular regulation has tried to make them into dumb pipes, you know, just these kind of giant pipes delivering indiscrim you know, indiscriminately mm -hmm. kind of data. But the services that we want to use actually need very sophisticated. Um, they have sophisticated needs. They, um, you know, have a, a certain kind of um, treatment, if you will, that they need to have in order to work. Some has to be prioritized in a certain way. So and again, you don't want to wait 10 years to do that. You want to be able to use, start delivering today in an intelligent way, ever better service. So we have software defined networking. We have a number of ways to make the existing networks we have more efficient through software improvements, through better management and so on. And then also, so part of that idea of selling the content or adding value added services helps the companies get revenue in the short run to to fund those long-term improvements. Mm -hmm. well, now, I think you've led us in a, in a useful direction and it raises questions when, when we talk about the internet as a series of you know dumb pipes of internet service providers as providing pipes like a utility company would, your water pipes or sewer pipes. This leads us to a conversation over net neutrality, which is still very much a live matter with the FCC you know, changing its approach, basically repealing some Title II net neutrality rules uh, recently to the uh, anger of a lot of uh, activists in the open internet activists. How, how does the 5G conversation affect that net neutrality debate? Uh, right. I mean, what well, does that look like a couple of years in the future? Well, so, I mean, I can tell you today, I mean, by definition, 5G is intelligent network. It is the antithesis of what net neutrality means if all data being treated the same. I mean, that is a totally... Um, from an engineering perspective, a dumb concept. It's a stupid concept. Uh, I mean, I like to bring it to the point of view of, you know, personal freedom and personal choice. You know, in a net neutrality world, I have to provision, I, I'm required by the FCC to buy an internet connection, which is enabled for content for which I don't support, I don't agree with, either politically or for my moral reasons. Um, I have to, you know, and I might not even purchase it, but I have to have, you know, I'm essentially paying for um, a capacity that I don't need. And in a, in a, um, a non-neutral world, in a world of Internet freedom, I'm actually going to support the sort of content and services and data I personally believe in that I think are socially valuable, not what's privately valuable. I know that you know, many people enjoy the films of Netflix, that's fine, but it doesn't mean I have to provision them. You know, I may enjoy other kinds of content, but, you know, in a free world, we, should, we shouldn't have to be coerced to support 
information that we don't personally agree with, we should be able to support information that we that we that we agree that we have, we find socially valuable. So, you know, one of the things I've always advocated for is, you know, a set of the internet, which is essentially socially valuable services which are provided for free, and you don't need a lot of data to do things like bus schedules or education, basic education materials, some kinds of, um, uh, you know, health care videos and things like that. And those kind of things have, are not allowed in the, in the net neutral world. We can, and, and these models are used in developing countries. So things like you want to check that your AIDS medication is not counterfeit or that you want to, um, uh, you know, you you have a, a woman suffering from a, a some from a terrible disease wants to watch a, a video on uh, some kind of information to to recover or how to take care of a child or whatever. Those kind of things are socially valuable, which should be provisioned for free either by the provider itself, philanthropy, the government, what have you, and they don't take up that much data. So I actually in a in a kind of world where there's flexible pricing for data, we can allow for some things to that everybody could access for free and then the part of the internet that's privately valuable, the entertainment, that part can be priced and that is up to the supply and demand and the free market and what have you. So this notion that all data is the same is fundamentally against the idea of, of a, a world where we have free thinking people because we don't value all things the same. And there are other cases where we can make to say, well, you know, it's, val it's socially valuable that certain kind of information you could be able at any time to go on the internet and access it. Just fine, fair enough, whatever the case may be. Um, but you know what? You want to see whatever someone's favorite video game or movie, you know, and you want it at a certain quality, you know, then that will have a, a slightly higher price or whatever. So we'd actually have a lot more internet for everyone if we allowed flexible pricing. And, and so this to me is, this is one of the areas where this particular policy is so fundamentally unfair and cruel to the poorest people to being a socially minded policy where everybody would benefit, you would actually allow flexible pricing. Just to give you another example, you know, I live most of the year in Denmark and sometimes I have to testify in a regulatory hearing in another country. I can go on Skype or whatever and do my testimony rather than getting on a plane. I'm willing to pay a little bit more for that you know, experience because I don't have to go on the plane. I'd like to guarantee the quality and so on. Today, I'm not, not you know, I'm in a net neutrality world, I'm not allowed to do that. There's a lot of ways. Yeah. So as we were, we were saying, right, we wanted to have this, um, you know, we would like to have for just this conversation, a quality guarantee that our connection would work and we can't buy that today. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it reminds me of, uh, I was just reading an article by uh, Tim Wu, who's the uh, – I think he's at Columbia, if I remember correctly, Columbia Law Professor, who coined the term net neutrality and is one of the, is an open internet activist. Um, he called for a nationalized 5G network. And so it's clearly a very different vision of what this future internet looks like. Um, I mean I think the – both parties over this debate want the same thing, which is – a competitive internet marketplace where uh, you know internet providers compete with each other. They have very different visions of how to arrive there. Um, so no, thanks for digging into that. I I would like to move now. I think to talking about a recent FCC decision uh, that might not be immediately obvious to our listeners what it means for five G, and that was the FCC deciding to cap uh, poll costs for putting up these five G antennas. And they capped the, the dollar vet, the cost of that to two hundred and seventy dollars. That's all municipalities are allowed to charge for them. What is the significance of that ruling? What's going on there? I, I, I don't know if our listeners are going to naturally understand uh, what that ruling means. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, and I just want to say that this this effort it was a, a an order voted on by the FCC on the twenty sixth of September around streamlining and fast tracking the rollout rollout of 5G it is a it's in the in the idea of telecommunications policy it's something we've been doing for 100 years so we have always had a a notion that there's value to communications there's a value to having all Americans having access to communications and that in part of the reason that the FCC was set up, I mean, not that it's perfect today, was to ensure a, an agency that could make, that could enforce the national policy. 
So, you know, of course, I don't, you know, I imagine our listeners would be bristling with the notion of a price control, but there are, are demonstrated problems. I can tell you, for example, you know, in Denmark, we had a case where 19 cities created a price cartel so that the rental price was four times the market rate. So unfortunately, a lot of local actors, they can band together and create these cartels that will restrict or inhibit the ability to um, to deploy networks. And the laws that the FCC has invoked are extremely clear because we have laws in the books for more than 20 years that localities, municipalities, they're not allowed to create undue burdens to companies who want to establish communications networks. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, whether it's undue delays to get the permits to build or it's an ex exorbitant price and so on, that's something that the FCC can, what we call preempt. Um, to, uh, to put a perspective, already at least 20 states have agreed, and they're red and blue states, they've said, look, we want networks, we want to streamline, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, we know that there's a lot of best practices that, you know, we can create a model code. So most of the states have already gone ahead and um, have agreed to, you know, streamline this so that, and the idea, of course, is we want the maximum number of providers to deploy, right? So for example, there's a policy called One Touch Make Committee that if you're going to have a street poll, it, that when you get that poll ready, that it it you can get five five providers on that street poll. It's not just the one. It's the same idea as a dig once policy. If you're going to dig a trench and put down a conduit, you know, by golly, make sure that everybody can use that trench. You know, don't you don't want to come back in a year and then say dig it up again because that's extremely costly. So these are a lot of common sense ideas. This is unfortunately to you know, we had at the beginning, like 20, 25 states already went ahead and said, we're adopting the model code. We want to be fur We want to get moving. You know, China is moving 12 times as fast as we are to get network deployed. We got to step up the pace. And what we have now is a lot of cases where we have holdouts, where you have cities that have chronically mismanaged their resources. They're in deep debt and they look at this opportunity as a way to earn revenue. So they'll say, hey, $5,000 for every street poll. I mean, that just doesn't scale. If you want to have these networks in rural areas and you want them across the U.S., you have to be able to have a, a reasonable, rational approach to the pricing. And the other point is, these are not natural markets in the sense that, you know, there's not a natural market for the street poll. It's a monopoly. It's owned by the city. They, you know, and there's they're essentially the owner. They don't have, there's not competing providers of street poles. So this is, this is again, and I'm a free market person. This is a case where regulation is, is, is necessary because you have to put the, you have to provide the information and you also have to protect from abuse. I mean, I suppose uh, I should say I, I have a certain degree of built in, uh, caution or skepticism uh, some of that's the you know the concern I, I it makes perfect sense that national regulations are cleaner and neater and more convenient uh, for uh, infrastructure development at least with a relatively light touch FCC that we currently have uh, but it does raise concerns to me about overriding localism I mean there's like a federalist kind of sure. question well, here yeah so let me say this I mean this is a case where you have to be careful because one area as a nation where we have looked at federal, the need for federalism is communications policy. These are laws that are very clear from our, our Telecommunications Act in 1996. And, um, you know, if you don't like those laws, well, we can update that. I would offer updating that act. But that has not been something that, um, you know, Republicans have been trying to do that now for five years and have not had any cooperation. But we really need to update that. Communications Act. But for the moment, that's what we have. That's what the American people, we have agreed to in Congress. It's been extremely successful to give us the other generations of mobile wireless that we enjoy. And, and so the FCC is just applying that um, to this next generation. And, you know, they have been extremely careful to stay within the boundaries. I mean, that was the, the big critique about the prior FCC. They kept pushing and exceeding the boundaries of their authority. And this FCC is very clear to be within the boundaries, to interpret the statute as it's written, you know, don't overinterpret it. Um, 
So, but what I'd say is communications policy is one area where as a nation over the last century, we said there's a value to having everybody having a telephone or everybody having access to the internet or what have you. So, so this is just that in that vein. And especially when everybody says they want more competition, you're not going to get more competition unless you allow the provider to come into your community, whether it's by wire or wireless or satellite or whatever. You, you have to let the network be built. Otherwise, you're not going to get more competition. It, it reminds me that we're not operating from a, uh, a state of nature here, that we have this whole set of, of institutions and, and systems that, uh, that constrain the kind of ideal telecommunications system that we want. So, you know, for example, well, we have this network of municipal – utility monopolies, right? There, there's phone poles right. all over the country. Sure. Now, in an sure. ideal world, that wouldn't have been – we might not have constructed our energy and water and sewer grids in that way. But that's what we did. And so yeah. we're confronted with that. We're not dealing with a with kind of a free market for our energy grid and whatnot. Right. So we have to right. deal with this already kind of distorted – system the best we can. So, you know, yeah. uh, we can't let the best be the enemy of the better, I, I suppose here. Correct. I, now, I yeah. think the, and, and, and by the yeah. way, the spectrum as well. I mean, as I said, we have more, we're one of the most important things has been to try to recover more spectrum and getting other kinds of providers to buy spectrum. That's also really important that, you know, it's the supply that we get more supply in the marketplace. And we can argue that the history, the, the history around spectrum was constrained that limited the number of players the same way with franchises. I mean, if you were a cable company in order to get permission, you had, you made a deal with the local provider. You had to provide coverage to everyone. And now people forget that those deals were made and that was what the community agreed. And now they don't like that anymore because then they'll say, Oh, well, we'll take the public money and compete. So we're always, you know, there's always been past decisions that have consequences for the future. And, and that's, um, you know that's one of the that's one of the challenges that we work with. But technology is amazing because now we're finding out, hey, we can overcome the past monopoly or legacy with the new technology. We just override it. And we find out a new way to do it. That's a that's a good lesson I think for us to end on. Uh, thank you, Rosalind, so much for coming on. Uh, I appreciate your time and for our listeners. Until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.